preamble, let's begin with a word of prayer. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for the beautiful creation that you have granted to us as a gift that we get to enjoy and uh, be blessed by each and every day. We pray that you would help us to be good stewards of it so that we would uh, be caretakers of the blessings we've received from you. We also pray that as your creation is your handiwork and uh, certainly gives an ongoing reminder of the wonderful creator that you are, we pray that you would work that knowledge in our minds so that our faith would be strengthened uh, to know that we have a God who loves us so much, who could create stars billions of light years away, and yet loves us more than anything else he's created. As we study together today, we ask your spirit to be upon us, to guide us and lead us, so that our hearts may be guarded in all the days to come. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, now I also should say that one of the reasons we record these Bible studies is because this is what our 5th and 6th graders are learning. So this hand, these handouts might sometimes seem a little bit juvenile at times. That is intentional. It's originally, uh, it was originally written for our confirmation program. Um, and so if a kid misses class on a, on a Sunday, they and their parents can go back and watch this video during the week and, and get uh, all the material that they missed and probably a lot more because I like to talk. So. On the first page, we'll begin right at the top. Many people in the world today don't believe that God created everything like it says in the Bible. Instead, they believe in the theory of evolution. This theory says that basically the universe, the universe just appeared and that every living thing in it evolved out of a single cell. They also say that all this happened randomly over billions and billions of years. But if that theory is true, then God wasn't our creator and the Bible cannot be trusted to be true. On the other hand, if a person believes that the Bible is true, then they can't also believe in the theory of evolution. And there are three reasons for that. First of all, the theory disagrees with what God said in Genesis 1, where it says God created the universe in six days, not billions of years. <coughs> As an aside, one of the reasons why they claim that it has taken billions of years is because for all of the things to happen as they say happened requires great lengths of time. Uh, so simply put, even if they didn't have any evidence whatsoever that the earth was billions of years old, they would still say it has to be because all of these evolutions could not have happened in less time than that. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why they claim the earth and the universe are billions of years old. Secondly, also in Genesis, God said that Creatures and plants will reproduce according to their own kinds. That means that animals and plants can only come from the same kind of things that they are. And we did talk about that last week. Finally, we know from Romans 5, verse 12, that sin came into the world before death did. Here's one opportunity we have to actually use our Bibles today. So, would you please turn to Romans chapter 5. When you hear pages stop turning, that means most people have found it. And someone could please read verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because of all sin. Okay. So if we were going to do a timeline, which I don't have a whiteboard or anything here, we have three things. We have sin, we have death, we have man. Which one of those came first according to not only Genesis, but also Romans chapter 5? Which came first, sin, death, or man? Man. 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 Why? Why do you say that? Because God created man. Well, okay, but use only this text. Using only this text, how do you know that man came first? It came through man. What did? Sin. Yeah. Sin. So sin couldn't have existed before man because man brought sin into the world. So man comes first, then he sinned, and then finally on the timeline, yeah. death. Yeah. Because, of sin. because of sin. So it goes man, sin, then death. According to evolution, I think this comes up later, there have been millions and millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, of things dying. 
That's what's required for things to evolve by natural selection. So uh, according to evolution, death would have existed before man because man didn't come along until things evolved into human beings. So when people say, oh, you know, the Bible, what, what does it say about creationism? Well, here's one good text. We know where death came from, it came from sin. We know where sin came from, it came from man. So man could not have existed before death because he's the one who brought it into the world. All right. So that was point number two, that uh, uh, sin came into the world and then death, uh, and that's all the result of man being here first. Uh, and as, that's, as I explain in the next sentence, that means human beings had to be here first because it was their sin that brought death into the world. Uh, but if evolution was true, that would mean that all kinds of creatures would have existed for billions of years without ever dying before human beings came along. Uh, since evolution requires death, natural select selection is a driving force for evolution, how could that be unless the Bible was wrong? There is a really easy way to get around this and other texts if you want to believe evolution is true, what do you have to do? If you want to believe evolution is true, what do you do with the Bible? You say it's wrong. It's not true. That there are parts of it that are not the inspired word of God, but are just something that somebody wrote. So the, the claim would be Moses was just writing down stories that have been passed down to him. And these stories from Genesis are in no way... Um, biblical in, in terms of being absolutely true. But then what do you do with Paul's text from his letter to the Romans? Because if, if Paul is wrong in his letters to the Romans, if he can make errors, well then how do we know that when he wrote to them we're saved by grace through faith is true? How do we know that all of that wasn't just made up to make sinners feel better about themselves? And the real truth is you have to be good or God will hate you and condemn you to hell. In other words, once you start down that rabbit hole of picking which texts of the Bible are true and which ones aren't, it can only lead to doubt, because how do you know any of it's true then? And in the end, you'll just end up picking for yourself which ones are true and which ones aren't, and then whose word is it? Yours. Because you're just deciding what you want to believe instead of what God has said in his word. So, that's the problem for a lot of Christians, is they can't both be true. And you have to pick one. Um, and uh, hopefully, um, at least that's the Missouri Synod's position, that the Bible is true, and everything else that contradicts it must be wrong. All right, let's move on. Some Christians want to believe that God used evolution to create the universe. Uh, that's called theistic evolution. Um, and basically, it's just what it says. That well, why didn't why couldn't God use evolution as His mechanism for creating? Well, that still contradicts what the Bible says about how God created it. Uh, how did God create? If you remember Genesis chapter one, he, spoke. He, spoke. he said, "Let there be." And when and that word that was used in Genesis for create, bara, the Hebrew word, what does that mean? If you remember. It means he created it out nothing. of nothing. He did not take already existing things and use that to create. He created out of nothing. And you have the Romans 5 text as well that says man came before sin and death. Uh, but even if you want to try to reconcile evolutionary theory with creationism by saying, well, God did it all, but that doesn't agree with what the Bible says. You're just simply trying to take God and inject him somewhere where he doesn't belong, which is in a, in a false theory like that. So this is a big deal. Um, as I may have alluded to before, when kids get off into high school and get into college, that's the number one reason they leave the church. And I don't mean leave this church. I mean they leave the Christian church. They want nothing to do with it. It's because they have been led to believe the Bible was wrong because they have teachers that tell them, oh, this is how things were created, and they go, well, wait a minute, that's not what I learned, and they make a choice. I'm going to believe my professor more than what God's Word says. And so it's, that's why it's important to continue to, to um, put this information before God's people so they understand that God's Word has to be true, or none of it is true, um, and there are very good reasons for believing in what the Bible says, scientific reasons things we observe in nature. 
and there are very good reasons to reject the theory of evolution. Um, I don't know if this was something I read yesterday or something that was in the presentation yesterday, but there is a, a, a very well-known scientist who says, all of us scientists know that evolution doesn't work. It just isn't true. So why do they keep teaching? Because they got to teach something. They're not going to teach God's word, but they got to teach something. So they're just going to stick with something that high-level scientists know doesn't work and it's not true. It's sad, but that's just the reality of how things are. Also, when I talk about kids leaving the church, uh, for the first time in the history of our country, less than 50% of Americans identify with some organized religion. They just aren't members of any church at all. Um, so interesting times that we're living in, and certainly at times where we need to continue to stand firm on God's word. All right. The biggest difference, this is halfway down the last paragraph, between the Bible and evolution is what the Bible says about man himself. If evolution is true, then man is just an animal and nothing more. We really see that come out when it comes to discussions about sexuality. I can't tell you how many times I have heard adults say, you can't teach abstinence to kids. They're never going to do it. They have to have sex. They're, they can't control their urges. Well, you know who can't control their urges? Animals. You can't put food in, well, this is speaking from experience, you can't put food in front of a cat and have it sit there and not eat it. Our darn cats gulp everything down the minute it's put on the floor. Okay? You can't put a steak in front of a dog and have him look at it and go, I don't think I should have that. <laughs> They're animals, they have urges, they act on those urges. Human beings are different. We don't have to, we have urges, we certainly do. Many of them are sinful, but we don't have to act on them. And to say that we do sells us short as human beings. We are more than creatures. And there are other organizations that will compare humans to, to animals and say something done to an animal is like doing it to a human. No, that doesn't mean it's okay to harm animals, but it's not right to compare them to humans. We are certainly not humans. Uh, how do we know that? Because um, as it says in the last sentence here, God in his word says we are something special. We were created in his own image. Something not said about anything else in creation, not even the angels. Questions, comments, feel free to interrupt with anything uh, and uh, give me a chance to take a drink. I actually, so I started recently watching Friends since I was a young when that came out, and Ross... Rub it in, why don't you? Well, Ross is talking to Phoebe about um, evolution because he's a planet, planetarian or whatever that he does. He is a scientist, yeah. And she's, and she, I was actually surprised. She's like, no, I don't believe that. And he kept pushing her and pushing her to, yeah. to listen to what he had to say. Yeah, and, and you know we see that affirmed mm -hmm. all the time. Even any time you hear the word billions used in connection with the age of the Earth or the universe, I mean, that's a subtle way of promoting evolution. Um, it's unfortunate. As I said, um, scientists know that it's not true, but what else do they have? Nothing. So they got to stick with that because they, they won't teach creationism. Even something that has a lot of scientific basis in it, which is called intelligent design, um, it says that the universe has a creator. They, they don't try to say who it is, but there's just too much evidence that the universe was designed as opposed to happened randomly. But even that's not allowed because it's too close to mm. biblical teachings. So they, they won't allow that. Um, and, and, you know, someday if you wanted, for one of our family nights, we could watch a video. Uh, it's a... It's a comedy slash documentary about how all kinds of scientists have been fired from jobs at universities because they don't go along with what they're told to believe. So anyway, let's get back to the handout. The theory of evolution first began as an attempt to explain how the universe could exist without a creator. You see, the people who came up with this theory didn't believe in God, uh, and they didn't want others to believe in him either. So they had to find another way to explain how and where the universe came from. Charles Darwin is the one given credit for coming up with this God-erasing theory. He did his research in the 1800s, and ever since then, other scientists have been trying to find ways to prove him right 
and affirm his theories. I think it's ironic that the year that Darwin wrote his book, The Origin of the Species, which, you know, his book about how things evolved, he looked at how animals can evolve, which they do, uh, as they adapt to their environments, and he put forth the idea that, well, if they can modify their beaks or their feathers or the colors of their feathers over um, amounts of time, then with more time, that the birds could completely transform into something different. I find it interesting that at the same time that Darwin was saying that, Karl Marx was also coming out with his theories, which also erased God. I just found that out yesterday, that Karl Marx began his uh, promotion of his theories in 1848, which is the same year The Origin of Species came out. Uh, anyway, let's, let's get back to this, because I'm sure I'll touch on some of that again. Today, lots of scientists agree with Darwin. Audience participation time. Uh, according to an atheist, so take it for what it's worth, um, how many scientists identify as atheists? What percentage would you guess? I know one of them, for instance, Bill Nye, the science guy, is an atheist. Yeah. Because I've watched his videos growing up, and, yeah. Yeah. Well, what percentage? I mean, 80%. There, there's no candy that you get for being right, and there's no <laughs> shame for being wrong, because nobody can see. It's just my face on the video. I heard 80% is one guess. Anyone else? 60. 60%. 90. 90%. Anyone else? 30. 30%. Now, this is numbers of scientists or atheists. <laughs> the number, according to Bill Maher, who is an atheist and did a, a documentary about why religion is dumb, said that it's, I can't remember if it's 92 or 93 percent. So when you, when you understand the discussions taking place in the scientific community, is it any surprise that the vast majority of them would take a certain position when they already dismiss the idea that God exists? I'm yes. just saying, so you're talking about people that are well-known scientists and just people that identify as being a scientist? Scientists that were surveyed. Oh, okay. Identified themselves as atheists. I don't know that you could possibly survey every sure. single scientist, right. but somehow right. they did a survey like they do any others sure. to find out, and that was the numbers that identified as atheists. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, um, lots of scientists agree with Darwin. Um, that's probably because they don't believe in God. So, of course, you're going to believe in what Darwin had to say because you got nothing else. And I mentioned this to the, to the confirmation kids, and it went way over their heads. Mm -hmm. But it won't go over yours. You ever heard of Socrates, mm -hmm. Aristotle, mm -hmm. Plato, mm -hmm. generally considered some of the greatest philosophical minds of, in history? Mm -hmm. Did you know they all believed in God? They did. They didn't believe in our God, but they believed in a creator. Yeah, right. uh, I think it was Aristotle, I think, who referred to him as the first cause the thing that caused everything else to happen. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, and, and as we look through uh, history up until about the 1700s, almost all, everybody believed in a God, including all the scientists, and they saw evidence for God all around them. I think you'd be surprised to find out the number of Christian scientists who are very well known. Uh, Newton is one that springs to mind. Kepler is another, but you may not have heard of Kepler before. There are others, um, but... For whatever reason, they're not imprinted on my brain like other things are. But lots of scientists have believed in God, and lots of philosophers have believed in God for a very long time. Um, <clears throat> but that's obviously changed. Uh, now, next sentence. Unfortunately, even Christian, even Christian science teachers have to teach evolution in public schools. And as was pointed out yesterday, maybe we should refer to them as government schools, because technically all schools are public schools. Anybody can go to a Lutheran school, therefore it is public, but it isn't run by the government. So anyway, uh, science teachers have to teach evolution in government schools because they're not allowed to teach what the Bible says. And sadly, that's where many young people start believing that the Bible is not true. Uh, some Christians who don't want to believe in evolution will go along with it anyways because they're afraid to disagree with it. They think they'll be called stupid if they question or reject it. Uh, now, part of that is because none of us are scientists, myself included. Well, I don't know that for a fact. I suppose it could be somebody who's a scientist in here. 
Um, but most of us aren't scientists, and so we're discussing things with people who are supposedly experts that we're not. And we don't want to engage in those discussions because we would feel outgunned, so to speak. Well, I mean, I, if we ever wanted, I could teach a, I used to teach a unit on creation and evolution back when I was a, a Lutheran school teacher. We could go through that sometime, and you'd have some ammunition, so to speak, for those discussions. We're not going to go through all of it now. We'll go through a little bit now. Um, but that's why a lot of Christians will shy away from the argument is because they don't feel equipped to speak about it authoritatively as scientists. Um, and in some ways, you don't have to because you have a very simple choice. Who are you going to trust more, the Bible or scientists? Um, I wasn't planning on saying this, but when I was in 10th grade, my science teacher dragged me out into the hall and threw me up against the locker. His name was Mr. Oftely. He's probably not still alive, so I don't think I can get in trouble for saying this. And I don't think he's watching. But I was asking questions. Uh, and he was becoming frustrated because I was disrupting class and whatever. And he said, what is your problem? I said, what you're teaching doesn't agree with what the Bible says. And these are his words. If the Bible said the moon was made out of green cheese, would you believe that? Well, if the Bible said it, yeah. And he, that's when he went, I give up. And that was the end of that. Um, but that was my position, even as a 10th grader, is I'm going to take my stand on God's word and assume that he's right and you're wrong. Thankfully, the Bible doesn't say the moon is made out of green cheese. <laughs> Most of what it says in the Bible is clearly observable and identifiable as true. Some of the things to take a little effort to discover, but what we do find is it's all true. Uh, what we need to remember as Christians uh, is that people are going to dislike us anyway. As Jesus said in John 15, 18 to 21, another opportunity to open up God's word. What does Jesus say in John chapter 15, verses 18 to 21? And once again, I'd love to have somebody read it, but wait till you hear pages stop flipping so everybody has a chance to get there. John chapter 15, starting at verse 18, 18 to 21. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I choose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things will, they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. All right. They'll do this on account of my name. In other words, they will hate us simply because we're Christian. They don't have to have any other reason than that. This, this whole evolution thing is just one more opportunity for them to attack us. But as Christians, we need to get past the idea of being liked. We're not going to be. The more that people know who we are, the less likely we are to be accepted. Now, we hopefully have a, a circle and community of friends who love us and maybe are Christian as well. We don't have to worry about that. I'm just speaking in general terms. Uh, so, for example, we have a Bible study, of what I mentioned in the first service, coming up in October on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock, and it's going to be about being a Christian in a woke world. And people have asked me, are we going to put that online? No, because I don't want it to turn into something where the church is going to be attacked for having positions that are different from the world. Um, I don't want it to turn into that. Now, I don't know how many people would watch and it would turn it into that, but the more that we are honest about our engagements with culture, as long as we stay in our lane, so to speak, and talk about Jesus, we're pretty harmless. But when we start to talk about things like race issues, transgender issues, homosexuality issues, other things like that, um, then we start to really draw the ire of the world around us. And, and we need to be prepared for that and not shy away from it. I just don't want our Bible study to turn into something where it, it's going to be uh, an opportunity for the church and church members to be attacked. So hopefully you'll, you'll want to come on Wednesday nights for that, um, but that's why it's not going to be put online, is because the world already hates us. We don't need to give them more reasons. Uh, so. Anyway, the world's going to hate us anyway because it hated Christ first. Um, as long as you are following Christ in your life with your behaviors, you can wear that as a badge of honor. The world hates you? Good, because it hated him first. Now, I say 
as long as you continue to live a godly life. Because the world can hate you because you're a jerk. That's not a badge of honor. If you're just a horrible person who claims to be a Christian, that's not a badge of honor. <laughs> if you're, but if you are a disciple of Christ and, and love your neighbor more than you love yourself and you strive to be good and holy and all those things and the world still hates you, that you can wear as a badge of honor. All right, next paragraph. In this lesson, we're going to discuss some of the facts about evolution and show how they're not really facts at all. We'll also look at some of the things in nature that prove that creation account, as recorded in Genesis, is real as the way that things came to be. Hopefully by the end of this lesson, you'll see the theory of evolution is a lie of Satan, meant to deceive people and lead them away from God by causing them to doubt his word. The very first sin that was ever created, or not created, uh, committed, what did Satan say to lead Eve to sin? Did God really say this? Did God really say? And that's where it starts with all this stuff. He leads us astray by getting us to doubt God's word. All right, so now we're going to look at some of the differences between evolution and creationism. Evolution says the world is four and a half billion years old, um, and it has to be that old in order for all life to have evolved from just one cell. The world is 4.5 billion. The universe, they say, is anywhere between 10 and 20 billion years old. Now, between 10 and 20 doesn't sound so bad. When you attach a billion to it, it doesn't sound very scientific. You're off by potentially 10 billion years. What are you using to measure? Because it's not a very good measurement tool. Creationism, on the other hand, says the Earth is less than 10,000 years old. I don't try to get too hung up on figuring out an exact number of years. Um, some people will claim that they have a pretty exact number. It's between six and 7,000. Um, I don't go that far. I just know that it's not millions or billions and less than 10. All right, point number two, evolution says that over time, animals can change into completely different animals. They say this is because animals have been observed to make small changes, like changing colors or size. From that, they guess that with enough time, animals could make big changes too, enough to become a different species altogether. That's called macroevolution. Now, that's a name Christians give it. Uh, an, an evolutionary scientist would utterly reject any distinction. They say all evolution is, is all part of the same. As Christians, we need to be able to make that distinction. Macroevolution means a big change from one thing into another. Um, and there's no proof that that's ever actually happened. Uh, creationism agrees that animals do make changes within their species, but they remain that same kind of animal. These changes to creatures are observed in nature all the time. We refer to them as microevolution. Again, an atheist scientist is not going to make this distinction. We need to. We need to recognize evolution is true in as much as we're referring to how animals adapt to their environment. They do. Uh, matter of fact, it's one of the explanations for how Noah could bring all the animals on the earth, is that he brought all the animals that were on the earth at that time onto the ark. And as they reproduced over thousands of years, became different uh, varieties of dogs or cats or whatever, horses, cows. You know. we, we even know that in farming, how, you, how through crossbreeding and stuff you can create new animals, not new, but different breeds of animals. And through cross-pollination, we, we can make sort of new plants, but they're not new, they're just different varieties of plants. That's all microevolution, and, and it's observable, and we have no problem with that. We just don't accept that, that over enough time it changes into something else because there's no evidence that that has ever happened. Um, if I don't come back to that, because it might be coming up later, sometimes I forget what I wrote down and what's still in my head. Um, if I don't come back to that, remind me later, and I'll talk more about how they think things evolved. Uh, in order for one animal to evolve into, into another species, there must be in-between animals. Uh, some kind of link animal had to exist. For example, between a monkey and a cat, or cat and monkey, whichever one they would claim to come first. Uh, but so you have a cat, you have a monkey, if you believe that one evolves into the other, then in between, there had to be some cat monkeys, or monkey cats, or, or some kind of combination of those two things as they change. Guess what we can't find in the fossil record? Monkey cats. Monkey cats, for example. Or cat dog. Okay, right. <laughs> Um, so those are the links between creatures that are missing. Therefore, they're called missing links. And, and this isn't in here, I'm almost positive. Darwin said 
the single greatest argument against his theory is there are no links between creatures. They don't exist. And they never have. Um, and scientists still can't find them. Um, anyway, we'll see if we can come back to that later. Number three, evolution says fossils prove life on Earth evolved from simple creatures into more complex creatures. Why do they say that? Because the Earth has layers. And in the lower layers are simple creatures, and the higher layers are more complex creatures. They believe that the layers are time markers. And so that over time, there must have been simple creatures on the Earth at one time, and then millions of years later, there are more complex creatures. I'm going off script, but I'm just trying to explain it. Um, now there's a couple problems with that understanding. Is number one, the stratification of the Earth is not, is not um, static. In other words, it's not one year, one layer. You know, you, you cut a tree down, you all those rings, and I'm not a tree scientist either, but I think the rule of thumb is one ring for each year. Mm -hmm. If that's true, that's what's called static. Every year, one new ring. The Earth's layers don't work that way. They're called, it's called dynamic stratification, and the layers can, you can have 17 layers all in one year, and then the next year, there's no layers at all. So it, it's not a good measure of time. And one of the ways that we know that is in the layer of the Earth that is thought to be hundreds of thousands of years old, they found things like buttons from an Army, U.S. Army military uniform. Um, uh, that one. Well, time travel, I guess. Right. Um, so so there, there's, there is plenty of evidence to show that the Earth's layers are not good time markers. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why we should not assume that if the smaller creatures, more simple creatures are lower and more complex creatures are higher in the layers of the Earth, that's proof that there's somehow evolution. Notice they're not. There's no proof that the small, simple things became larger. They're just saying those were here before, and these came afterwards. Um, now, what does creation say? Creation says the reason for the layers of the earth and all the fossils in them was the flood. Um, I touch on it later, so I'll be quiet. Uh, we'll read about, I'm sure, the flood later. But the layers, I mean, if you've ever done any kind of little science experiment where you put dirt in a jar and you swish it around, you see how it forms layers as it settles. Uh, you know the same thing is true if you have lakes or ponds near you, that the, you stir the stuff up and then eventually it settles again, that silt. Those are the layers. Um, the flood explains why the earth has layers. Because it, after the, the flood started to recede and the, the flood waters covered the earth for over a year, when they finally started to recede, you better believe there were layers being formed. Um, but that also explains why simpler creatures are in the lower layers of the earth. Now, if you think about the flood as a catastrophic event that took place in a relatively short period of time, as, as the earth's uh, waters are filling up and, and dirt and stuff is churning <laughs> everywhere, which would be the creatures most likely to be caught by the rising flood waters? Simpler creatures who, who had no means of escaping rising flood waters. So what do we find in the lower levels of the Earth's layers? Things like trilobites and different kinds of bugs and that kind of stuff because they didn't, they didn't go anywhere. They just stayed in, you know, worms. They just stay in the dirt. So they, they didn't go anywhere. Meanwhile, higher up in the layers of the Earth, what do we find? Mammals, birds. Of course, they've got fish throughout. Um, well, why would mammals and birds not be in the lower levels of the floodwaters? Because they, they would go away. If the water is rising, they're going to go somewhere to higher ground. They're not just going to sit there and be covered in water. They're going to go to higher ground. Now, this isn't listed here either, but we have fossils of fish on mountaintops. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. yeah, all over the world, we have fish fossils. Well, how do you explain that? Well, Evolutionists, I don't know what they would say, but what? <clears throat> yeah, I suppose. <laughs> well, there are fish that fly out of the water. Yeah. The water. Actually, I take it back. There is an, a, 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 I won't call it an excuse. There is a, a reason that they might give, and that is that mountains slowly rose up out of the seas, right? That over time, plate tectonics, and they went up. So somehow the fish fossils got trapped on there. But you know how fossils form? It's, it's, uh, it's coming to it here. One other thing. In order for fossils to form, you need water, dirt, and pressure. Mm -hmm. So how, how would all these fossils come about just by lying dead in the ditch? 
You know, there's never going to be deer fossils a thousand years from now. Why not? They're dead. They're laying in the ditch. Why aren't they going to become fossilized? Yeah. Lack of water, lack of pressure. They will just be slowly disintegrated over time. Or birds will eat them or whatever. So you need the, the moisture and the dirt to sort of encapsulate it. And they need tons of pressure to force fossilization. Well, there is an explanation for how that could happen on a worldwide scale. Flood and the amount of pressure that that water would put on things. Anyway, um, and that's, that's, a, that's a reason why I want folks to go to the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter, because all of the science of creation is laid out very clearly for everybody to see. Point number four. Evolution says they found skulls that prove man evolved from ape-like creatures. These are the only... Oh, yes, Jack. I have a question. Yeah. On the Creation Museum... Mm -hmm. I think you guys went to that, didn't you? We did, yes. Okay, how much time did you spend there? Or how much time would you recommend to spend there? We spent a whole day at each place. No, and each place. Yeah, there's two places. It's not combined. They're actually about 30 minutes apart, which I didn't know until we planned our trip. Okay. So, but, but they needed large amounts of land, and they couldn't you know, get it all together. And I think they were probably built at separate times anyway. So the, there's two separate things. They, they are from the same organization. They, they consider themselves connected, but they are separated by about 30 miles. And I would say at least a day. We did a day at each place, and we could have easily spent more time. But it's a lot of walking, and I'm out of shape, so that's one reason we didn't stay longer. Okay, the, the one in the bypass, which one is that then? Because we go by that one and go back to South Carolina. I think that's the ARC exhibit, I think. Because I, I think I know what you're talking about, is uh, that highway that goes right by it, and I yep. think that's the ARC, I think. Okay. But I, my memory is terrible, so. Okay, thank you. It yeah. takes a long time to read. It's yeah. Evolution. There, there is a lot to read. There I took a lot of pictures, and I don't know. Maybe someday I'll do a just a one day thing, and I'll just show all the pictures I took because a lot of them are of the plaques. I'm like, I don't have time to read all this, but if I take a picture of it, I can read it later. <laughs> So even if we never go, I can take you on a tour of it, I guess, just based on pictures. All right, so evolution says that skulls prove uh, the evolution from ape-like creatures to human beings. Now, these are the only missing links that exist. Uh, now, you should know that there are a number of sort of skeletons that have been found. They've all been de eventually debunked as fake. Um, Piltdown Man was one. Lucy. Uh, Lucy wasn't fake, it was just a monkey, it always was a monkey. Um, a lot of times what they do is they take bones from up to miles apart and then reconstruct them and say, oh look, look what we found, you didn't find that, you, you made that. Um, I won't go into all of that, but the one thing that they, they still hang their hat on is, well just look at the skulls, look how different they are. These are clearly ape skulls, these are human skulls, and look at these things that are sort of ape-like and sort of human. That shows Transition. Well, you know, if we all peeled the skin off of our heads, we'd probably have different shaped skulls too. I've got one of these kind of larger brows, and I'm sure a million years from now they'll go, hey, there's another missing link, see? That used to be part monkey. Um, but in reality, if you were to take all of the skulls of all the monkeys and stuff, or all the humans, they're all different. So it's a little disingenuous to, to just pick and choose which ones and say, oh, this one's a little more ape-like, this one's a little closer to human, and just say, oh, see, that proves there are links. It just proves we all have different shaped skulls. Well, then just to think about, this maybe doesn't tie into evolution, but just different tribal people around the world, like thousands and thousands of years ago, how they would wear different things to make their neck longer, make their heads more cone-like. So then yeah. you bring that into the equation too, and you go, well, why is that? And you don't have that knowledge of that's a tribal thing, a country thing, a religious thing too. So, yeah. yeah. Well, the Indians used to put stuff on the baby's heads to make their mm -hmm. heads different. Mm -hmm. And that was it's all less. Yeah. Yeah, there's all kinds of plausible explanations for why we find different shaped skulls that are probably more likely and believable than we used to be monkeys at one point. Uh, creationism says, just what I said, skulls are simply different apes, different people, they're all shaped differently. Uh, if you look around the room, we all have different shaped skulls as well. Um, and the same thing is true of animals. Point number five, evolution says everything is constantly evolving, getting stronger, faster, smarter, better. 
I mean, that is a tenet of evolution because it's survival of the fittest, natural selection. What exists now survived, therefore it must be better than what existed before. And so they'll say, well, who knows what human beings will be in another million years. We might have telepathy or the ability to float or whatever. Um, so this is the, the basic tenet of evolution is everything is evolving and getting better. Things that aren't good enough will, will be uh, weeded out by natural selection. Um, now you'd expect that that would be the case if you thought everything came from one single cell, which is incredible. Uh, we know that as we pass, we have information in our cells. And we pass that information on. When you have two parents, each one of them has information that they then pass on to their child who will have all of the information that they inherited from their parents. But if you work backwards, that means that every living thing that exists now, and all of the living things have information in their cells, their DNA, all of that information would have had to exist in that single cell from which everything else evolved. What is the likelihood that all of the information of every living thing existed in one cell? Zero. doesn't seem very likely because you'd have plant DNA along with human DNA and monkey DNA and all the other DNA. Um, it just doesn't seem likely. What does creation, creationism say? It says there are laws of nature that would have to be broken in order for evolution to be true. That's one of the code words to say, there was a time when, that's their way of getting around laws of nature. Well, the laws of nature weren't always what they are now. Says who? They're laws, after all, but they'll say, well, they had, they couldn't have existed back then or evolution wouldn't be true. Exactly. All right, for example, law of biogenesis says living things can only come from the same living things. There is a scientific law that completely affirms what God said in Genesis 1. Things can only reproduce after the, the things that they were. The second law of thermodynamics says that all matter gets less complex over time. Instead of things getting bigger, stronger, faster, or smarter, everything breaks down and gets worse as time gets on. I'm living proof of that. Uh, well, I'm getting bigger, but I don't know about the rest of it. Um, and, and even in inanimate objects, we see that everything over time breaks down. Uh, science would say, unless something intervenes to um, change that directory, uh, direction, so to speak, everything will break down over time. Um, and that is what we observe, that everything does sort of break down over time. Uh, so evolution is kind of disproved in that way. And then finally, I referenced him earlier, Kepler's third law of motion makes the current configuration of the galaxies and solar systems impossible. Uh, I won't go into all the details. The simplified version is according to Kepler's laws of motion. When something goes around like this long enough, what will its orbit do? Bigger. It gets bigger. I mean, if you had your keys on a chain and you spun it for a couple minutes, probably you're not going to notice anything. If you kept spinning that for hours and days, that those little interlocking things might slowly start to give, um, especially the more keys you have on it, and, and that force would pull it apart. Kepler's laws of motion say that when things are spinning, eventually they are expanding and spreading out. And in order for um, our universe, I shouldn't say universe, our galaxy, which is spinning, to still be held together, it doesn't make sense. Because if we've been around for billions of years, what should our galaxy have done by now? Spread all out and, and dissipated as a galaxy. Um, I believe I read a million years was about as long as anything could continue spinning, like a solar system, a million years now, is the longest anything could spin before it just, just split off and, and dissipated. There was no longer anything holding things together, like gravity, for example. Um, and of course they say the Earth is four billion years old. How could our solar system still be held together after billions of years when the law of of motion says no more than a million. There is an answer, by the way. There is a scientific answer for how our galaxy and our solar system are still held together when they should have split all apart and, and flew all off into space um, long ago. Does anybody know? Gravity. It is a form of gravity, but the gravity of the, our sun, for example, would not have been enough after all this time to keep our solar system together. So what's holding everything still in orbit? You probably have heard of it before, you just didn't know what it was. 
It's two words. The first word is dark. Dark matter. Dark matter. Scientists have said that there must be some unmeasurable, unverifiable, unprovable force holding galaxies and solar systems together. That's the only explanation for why everything is still together. It hasn't, you know, flown off into space. Dark matter. Well, how do you measure it? Well, you can't. Well, how do you know it's there? Well, it has to be. Because why else would the universe still be together? Well, there is another alternative. Maybe the universe isn't billions of years old. Yes? I was just thinking that, okay, if there's dark matter and you can't explain it, you can't measure it, it's, it's God. Like, they're basically saying it's God without saying it's God. Or they really stink at math, too. If you believe that the, that the solar system is billions of years old, and it's still held together somehow, and the sun's gravity would not be enough on its own, there has to be some other force at work holding it together. Or, we're not that old. Right. So they have a choice. Right. And they decided, well, clearly we're old, so there must be something holding us all together. All right, these are just a few examples of the laws of nature and science that would have to be broken or false in order for the theory of evolution to be true. The fact is that many scientists today are willing to lie to people because they simply don't want there to be a God. There was an illustration that it showed unborn, I don't know if it was an animal or if it was a human being, but it was in the 1800s, so they didn't actually know. It was an artist's drawing of what an unborn, I think it was human, looked like, and it gave human beings a tail. Um, unborn, and they, they, you know, we lose the tail as we gestate and get older, but, but in the womb we have a tail. That was in science textbooks for years and years, long after we figured out fetuses don't have tails. But they kept it in the science books. And I think that there are still some science books today that will continue to have that drawing as evidence of evolution. And, and they'll say that our tails that we had in utero uh, is an example of a stygial organ. In other words, an organ that we had is a leftover of evolution that we don't need anymore. Uh, of course, we don't have a tail at all, but they claim that we do. Other things are like our appendix um, is another vestigial organ um, because we don't really need it. We can take it out and we can survive. But other medical science has said, but un, uh, uh, young children definitely need their appendix. It's what helps them fight off diseases when they're young. And children do have remarkable immune systems, which look at COVID. Children up to a certain age are practically immune to it. Why? Well, I don't know what all the science is behind it, but we do know that children have remarkable immune systems, much better than us when we get older. And that has been attributed medically to the appendix, that, that at least when they're young, that helps them fight off uh, diseases. Uh, I remember when our oldest son, Jake, got sick and he was just not doing well. The doctor was like, eh, no big deal. And we thought, what a horrible doctor. We're worried about this kid dying, you're acting, it's no big deal. Nah, kids are resilient. They'll be fine, and he was. You know, but his, his argument was, kids have much better immune systems than we do. He'll be fine. Um, and, and he was. So anyhow, um, getting back to the handout here, uh, they don't want there to be a God, so they're willing to go, with, go along with any kind of lie that will support that. Um, that's why they distort science and manipulate it so it appears to agree with what they want to be true. And then they ignore or erase all things that prove that the Bible is true. Uh, I know we're running out of time. There's something called theory predicted bias, which basically means if you already believe something is true, you will only be able to see things that confirm it. And it's just the way we're wired to see <coughs> human beings. If something challenges something we believe to be true, we will reject it. It's very, very hard, and we can see that in our world today. It's very hard to convince somebody they're wrong about something, even when it's clear that they are. But if they believe something different, you just can't shake that from them. And it's the same thing in the scientific community. If they believe something is true, they are just not going to let it go, even if it is shown to them that they're wrong. And I could use some examples, but I won't. We're just going to move on. Uh, because we need to finish up. The father of lies is behind all this, Satan himself. Uh, the theory of evolution is just one of the ways he tries to trick people into turning away from God. The Bible says Satan's first sin against God was pride. He refused to submit to God because he wanted to be God himself. Uh, we do see that in the scriptures, uh, not necessarily in Genesis, but in other parts of scriptures it talks about why uh, the, the devil rebelled and it had to do with the fact he just didn't want to be under God. Um, and throughout history he's tried to trick people into wanting the same thing for themselves. What did he tell Eve? If you eat it, you will be like, like God. God. Uh, and by getting people to believe in evolution, Satan helps 
them pretend God doesn't exist. Once they believe that, then each person can be God of their own lives. That desires the sin of pride. Why would anybody want to deny there's a God? I mean, it's supposed to be comforting and, and we get a, a heaven to go to and all these wonderful things that are associated with God. Why would anybody not want to believe in a God even if, even if they, they weren't a Christian? Because they don't want to be told what to do. God has very specific commands for us on how we should live our lives. They don't want to follow those rules. And the easiest way to get around it is, if there's no God, then there's no rules. Uh, since so many people want to be gods of their own lives, they don't want God uh, to exist. Evolution helps people to believe that by imagining that everything could simply exist on its own without having been created by a creator. The theory of evolution helps people become gods for themselves also by denying the doctrine of original sin, which says we are all sinful from even before we're born because of Adam and Eve's, Eve's sin. By rejecting the notion that we are naturally and inherently sinful, they can convince themselves that they don't need a savior to redeem them from their sins. I'm a good person. It's a lie that Satan convinces many people to believe about themselves. The Bible says, you're not good, I'm not good, there are none who are good, uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The theory of evolution denies the Bible is true in four different ways. It says, number one, there is no God. Number two, that he didn't create us and therefore doesn't love us. Remember, the whole purpose of God creating us is to have a relationship with us. He wanted to be our father. He wanted us to be his children. He wanted us to be friends. He wanted a relationship. But if God didn't create us, then it's, there's no relationship. We don't need a savior because there's no sin. And finally, the Bible isn't trustworthy. What we need to remember when confronted with these lies is that we walk by faith, not by sight. No matter how many lies Satan tries to use to trick us, we know what the Bible says, and we believe it, even when everyone tells us not to. By faith, we know that God exists, that he loves us and created us to be with him forever, and that he made eternal life possible for us by sending his son, Jesus, to save us from our sins by dying and rising again. The reason this is such good news for us is we know that it's true. If the Bible wasn't telling the truth about creation, we'd have no reason to believe that God was telling us the truth about salvation either. That's why all of this matters. Okay, I'm going to stand up and hopefully still be on screen. Any closing thoughts or questions? Or comments? If not, then we'll re return next week to our regularly scheduled Bible study by getting back into the Bible and uh, going through it more thoroughly than we did today. Um, if at some point you ever want to have a special gathering where we go over creation and evolution in a very specific way, or, or I take you on a tour of the, the uh, Ark Encounter and Creation Museum, you know, those are all things we can do uh, sometime if that would interest you. May God bless your week in the Lord and, and uh, guide and guard you in all your ways.